Okay, and welcome to our second lecture on the concept of resilience. This time we're going to look at the theories around resilience, and often measurements are related to theories, so we'll progress into that. And once you can measure something, you can usually test it, so we're going to look at the evidence surrounding resilience. Generally, we'll come back to looking at resilience in sports, but often we find ourselves drawing from other areas, and where that happens, I'll try and make sure it's clear. So, a quick session overview, um, predictably really, we're going to look at the theories, and unusually in this area there are many theories. We're going to look at how it's measured, and there are some controversies around that, so we're going to try and make sure that uh, we reflect those controversies, and I'll just give you an idea of um, how to interpret the information we get. We're going to see if there are any things that correlate with uh, resilience, and that could mean that they are things that happen to simply accompany it. It could mean that there are things that lead to resilience or things that follow from resilience. Correlation doesn't tell us which of those things it is, but it shows that there is some kind of um, potential connection. And then if you've got a potential connection, you look at the interventions and see if uh, you can make things change to improve resilience, or if you can improve resilience, what does that change? And that's when you can start making conclusions that this thing is important and influential. So we're going to start with theories, and once again we're going back to uh, our recurring names of Fletcher and Sarkar. They reviewed uh, a number of theories in their 2013 paper where they looked at how we conceptualise it, define it, and how we theorise about it. And they found there was at least 17 theories at that time, and I'll warn you now there's been even more since. So we need to at least just reflect on those quickly, and I'll just show you... Um, the screenshot that I've taken from that paper. Um, some of them are maybe labelled as theories and they might not actually hit the criteria for a theory. So a friend of mine went to great lengths once to try and distinguish between uh, what he called a framework, a model and a theory. And sometimes a framework is just um, a sketch almost, a, you know, maybe you can drop things into categories and it just gives you some idea that there's a difference. A model tends to suggest that there's some connections with some arrows, but theories generally have quite strict conditions that they must do at least two things. They must explain what's going on in some system so that if you can make an observation, it fits with your theory. That's half the battle. But also they must predict future events and therefore um, lay themselves open to being proven wrong. And if they predict different events to other theories, that's interesting because it marks them out as separate. And then, of course, if they happen to be right, that's brilliant. But it needs to predict and, and needs to make predictions that could be proven wrong, not just predictions that there's always um, you know, hedging and, and get-out clauses. So it must hit those criteria to be a formal scientific theory. And that goes back to kind of Karl Popper in the 70s um, trying to work out what the difference was between science versus non-science, and he called it the demarcation problem. So we could, we could be talking about things here in the next few slides that aren't for theories because they aren't easily um, giving us testable hypotheses. So you can see that there are differences as we work down that middle column, for example, between uh, some that are de derived from family situations some that are derived from organisational and corporate situations, some from nursing, um, and that's and military, I think, comes up as well. And that's important because you would expect, as we've explained in our previous talk, you would expect different stressors, different coping resources, different support systems uh, to be in each of those different contexts. So you might well expect to see different... Um, types of resilience and therefore different theories of resilience in each different area. However, you do tend to see um, some little consistencies coming through as well, so you tend to see that there is uh, perhaps a pattern of homeostasis comes up a few times or some sort of um, happy, comfortable zone in, from which you can be disturbed. And so that there's always an idea of adversity causing some kind of impact or a stress or causing some kind of impact. And there's usually some element of um, a process, be it a coping resource, be it a skill, um, that actually helps to ameliorate that. And it could be that you either get back to normal 
and in some cases that is quite an achievement with really severe stresses or it could be that you actually come out of the um, experience stronger for it but in both cases there is some kind of diversity. Remember we're using it as our background picture the many-headed hydra which every time it was had a head cut off it would grow another one too and it would grow back stronger and we're using that as a potential uh, representation of resilience whereby it's possible to not only survive difficult moments but actually learn from them and if we progress with the work of Fletcher and Saka as they've studied this they talk about adverse experiences being vital to the development of resilience. A few more just to show you the rest uh, again we can just scan down and go okay so there are some different approaches in here um, there are some theories which seem to conflate um, coping with resilience and we think they're different things so I think I've said last time coping can contribute to resilience but it's not one and the same thing you might be that you exhibit a resilient response to a situation without deploying conventional coping resources in terms of um, problem solving for example or you do something a little bit different or that your network around you is um, activated and you don't have to do much yourself uh, so when you have this many theories you end up in a situation where you want to find similarities um, it's actually not that helpful to have so many theories because quickly you'll leap to how do I choose the right one? How do I choose the best one for my client or for this experiment? Um, and part of that decision could come from, let's pick one that's um, focused on my particular topic or population, like military, nursing, police, whatever. But even between those contexts, you see different qualities of theories, and some of them clearly acknowledge the adversity and positive adaptation uh, definition of resilience. Some of them don't. Uh, so you have not only different domains to work in, but different quality of theory within each of those domains. And you know, we keep getting more theories, so I was just I wanted to illustrate to you that more keep emerging, even since that review by Fletcher and Saka. Um, and you, you, know, you want to sort of see diagrams, I think. It's nice to be able to see how things work. Um, however, it's worth noticing that some of these don't necessarily tell you how things work. They're just connecting things with arrows. You don't know if uh, you need to increase or decrease the thing and how that um, effect is generated from one thing to the other. So that's actually quite um, a challenge. And if I just zoom in on one that's quite recent, this was built, and I think it was quite elegant in a way, by looking at all the things that appear to correlate around resilience. And you get some quite strong correlations and that's really encouraging. So you go, okay, look, you know that these two things correlate. I'm not sure if it's um, permissible to actually put directions on the arrows if we have correlations, because they don't tell you which way the arrow goes. That's just a quirk of correlation methodology. But even then, when you've carefully selected out these proven or at least you know well demonstrated relationships, it's actually quite hard to know what to do with. This model. So, if you wanted to say, okay, um, I've got an athlete who's having a problem uh, with their personal life and it's affecting their performance, I look at this and go, okay, well, hmm, where can I actually get traction on that problem? Do I want to build resilience? Do I want to affect performance? Um, it's actually really hard to know what to do. And of course, that's going back to our theory about, uh, sorry, a definition of what a theory should do. It should tell us how to act in the future. It should say in these circumstances you change these things to get that result. That's how we form hypotheses for experiments and that's how we use theories to help clients. So despite all the really hard work that must have gone into this, it's still quite hard. It's what you'd call a descriptive theory and therefore more likely if we were to try and distinguish between models, frameworks and theories, we call this a model. It's got connections, it's not just a classification system, but actually it's quite hard to make predictions from it, I would contend. When we look for consistencies in the theories, the things which should come through them and the things which are consistent with the definition are that resilience is dynamic and it's constantly in flux and it changes over time, um, which, skipping ahead, makes it difficult to measure 
using questionnaires because they usually assume some level of consistency over time and they tend to only uh, measure things about the person um, and their personality and it's, that's a key assumption of measure, measuring things that are stable about a person. But the theories tend to suggest, the good ones at least, that we have this concept that's dynamic and changing, it won't hold still for us to study easily. And it talks about these multiple factors that are interacting and you get different weightings ascribed to them. So as you scan down the table or if you choose to read in further detail, some theories um, put more weight on the individual and say it's all about personality, experience, skills and attributes. And some theories put more weighting on the actual surrounding network and look at the social support and relationships and how they're provided and how the person perhaps seeks support from those things. And even then you'll find individual variables given different weightings potentially. And we need to question as well whether resilience is the outcome we're seeking to build and we want a theory that tells us how to build resilience or we want resilience to give us improved performance or improved other outcomes, quality of life, happiness, whatever. And that's a different type of question. So is resilience the system that produces the outcomes or is it the outcome itself? And in those theories, we get different perspectives on that question. And I suppose, recently at least, we're saying that resilience is the system, the mechanism that produces the outcomes, not the desirable outcome itself. Because it, it can change so much and it should change, it's meant to change by context, situation, over time, etc. When we try and look at consistencies, there's a possibility if we draw from military, family, uh, life hardship, police, fire engines, whatever, we find there's a possibility of perhaps building some kind of super theory that combines all of them, meta theory. And that has been attempted at least once. It was back in 2002, and the idea is that there is this state of biopsycho-spiritual homeostasis. Um, which is quite a long word, but you know, if you imagine talking about, well, biologically, I'm in a, a good state, I'm in homeostasis, psychologically, uh, I'm stable and happy, but also it extends to talking about some kind of spiritual level. Now, that doesn't mean uh, aligning to one particular um, religion or viewpoint in life, but I suppose it's evoking the idea that the person is happy with um, the meaning they ascribe to life and their purpose for living. So it could include someone who's staunchly uh, atheist, someone who's staunchly religious, as long as they are comfortable with that. And therefore in a state of homeostasis on all three of those levels. So the idea is that some stressor um, comes along or some threat to your resources and that knocks you out of homeostasis. So it's quite a, a simple a metaphor in a way that you've got a happy system and you knock it with some kind of stressor and then you've got four choices as to how you react you could bounce back stronger and that's called resilient reintegration whereby um, whatever it is that happened has actually given you new skills new um, perspectives or whatever and you've come back to a better position than you were before and if we look at this slightly gray diagram on the next page you'll see that you get knocked, you go into a state of disruption, and then you can reintegrate, and at the top there, you've got resilient integration, where you've come back somehow more capable and stronger than you were before. Second option would be homeostatic reintegration, where you get back to where you were before, um, and you've somehow survived or you know, coped, just got, got through the problem. And that's the second option in our diagram, so back to where you were before. There's uh, reintegration with some loss, where you don't quite get back to where you were before, and that's the second from bottom there. So you're not, you, do, you do recover, but you don't recover fully. And then finally, there's that dysfunctional reintegration at the bottom, whereby you actually remain um, you know, a long way out of your homeostasis, and that could be physically, it could be psychologically, it could be spiritually, because the whole thing is meant to come as a package. It might be 
that within our within this theory there are sort of some prescriptions as to what makes the difference. But it, it seems like um, a lot of the effort and the description around this theory is actually just describing these different situations and uh, different sort of describing the model itself. And it is a descriptive model as opposed to perhaps an explanatory theory. So Fletcher and Sarkar um, paid particular attention to this in their review and said, look, you know, there are some problems with that as a theory, as a meta-theory of resilience. Uh, it's linear, it considers just one event to be the thing that knocks you, and of course that probably doesn't reflect real life. Very often um, we are part of a complex system, and it could end up being, you know, that's saying the straw that broke the camel's back. It could be that the whole system is under stress, and some tiny thing is what actually tips you out of, out of homeostasis, shall we say, out of balance. So you've got uh, a complex system of resilience, and resources and skills, dealing with a complex world of demands and challenges. It could be that your system itself functions differently, and that something about it is, is changed, and this world itself hasn't changed, or it could be that the world places different demands on you. And it's hard to say with any certainty that there's one event or one stressor that causes that loss of homeostasis. So that's one key criticism. Another key criticism is that the model acknowledges there could be some primary emotion in terms of sadness or anger in response to that um, loss of homeostasis. But a key element of how we deal with stress and challenges and difficulty is what they call meta-emotions and metacognitions, whereby you not only have that emotion or thought, but you also are conscious of it and analyse it. And that's one of the wonderful things about being human that many other creatures in the world can't do, is that you can realise, I feel sad, I feel scared, and actually pause and say, well, is that appropriate? And I think we've talked about some examples in our previous talk whereby um, people in a moment, in a stressful moment, were saying, normally I would react that way and I felt like I wanted to react that way. But I've been working on not doing that and I stopped myself. And that's really... It, that's obviously a good example of a, a meta emotion, meta cognition, and you're aware of it, monitoring it, and that obviously will change a lot about how you react, and it will change the characteristics of resilience that person exhibits. And we know that people who ex demonstrate resilience, in, in the, if we pick people who've been through difficult situations or who achieved under pressure, they tend to monitor and appraise and, if needs be, adapt their emotions. So there's a, a famous saying from a 2001 paper, I think, talking about making the butterflies fly in formation. And of course that's a nice idea whereby you, and, and athletes famously, when they feel nervous, the athletes who tend to thrive say, good, I'm glad, I'm pleased that I feel that tension, otherwise I'm not ready. And the guys who interpret that same tension as being um, a threat and negative and I don't like feeling this way, they tend to be the guys who struggle. There's also this idea that um, this, this model, this meta-theory, focuses more on uh, coping as opposed to this kind of wider system. It, it seems to talk much more about um, personal coping strategies and coping skills, which actually led uh, Connor and Davidson, a very famous um, paper and questionnaire, to actually interpret it more that way when they did, did their work on resilience. So there are issues here because if we're trying to reflect something which is messy and complex and evolving and dynamic, and we're trying to simplify it down to stable, um, measurable things, then we're going to see this bias towards well coping, that's pretty stable, people tend to have the same skills for long periods of time. Um, it's much easier to sort of talk about primary emotions rather than meta emotions and you know, metacognitions. So it might be that we're actually um, using the wrong instruments and the wrong approaches to measure this because it is messy and complex and we're coming along with quite simple tools to try and measure it. Another 
uh, approach to developing theories, just as an example, is a grounded theory, um, which was done with Olympic athletes. So that's very sport specific and therefore quite useful if you're working in sport. Uh, and this was derived from interviewing athletes, analysing the, the quotes they gave about their experiences, about how they um, progressed and how they thrived. And then you normally try and not just categorise those quotes, but actually turn them into a model. And usually you actually take a model like that back to your athletes or find some new ones who are Olympic, you know, great performers. They say, is this a fair reflection of how you um, progressed and how you did well? And so the idea would be that Fletcher and Sarko actually positioned metacognitions and the appraisal process at the centre of resilience. So it's possible that there are stresses all the time, but that these other factors around them, these psychological factors, are actually determining and key in your metacognition and your appraisal of the emotion, and that determines a lot of what happens next. So they would say, okay, well, if you're really confident, your meta appraisal would be no problem. If you're really, really focused, you might not even notice these distractions and stressors. If you've got great social support, or if you feel that you've got great social support, you might again say, no problem, Jeff will deal with it, Dave will deal with it, Sarah will deal with it, whatever. So again, that's really important if to have that perception of social support, and it determines how you evaluate, how you appraise the situation. You could be that you're extremely motivated and you see stresses and go, oh, I don't care, I'm gonna carry on, that's not irrelevant to me, it's not important. And it could be, there's often this recurring theme of optimism, that you've just got a particularly positive personality and say, well, I'm sure things will turn out fine. They were the kinds of themes that came out in the interviews, and they theorised that those themes determine the way you appraise the situation, and that determines how you respond. So there's an important element there of, of actually that meta cognition and that appraisal process it appears to be, in this theory, the heart of the resilience system. Depending how you appraise, that will determine how you respond. And of course, you know, those responses could vary from giving up, uh, panicking, right the way through to no change, I'm fine, right the way through to actually, you know, benefiting, learning, improving. Uh, and that's, they're all possible, you know, broad strategies. And the idea is that that's actually informing the performance in a sport context. So because it was derived purely in sports, we'd have to ask, you know, can we transport this to the next setting? And of course, we'd have to be very careful. But at least that's an example um, of a fairly recent uh, attempt to build a theory. And it's at the beginning, it's quite close to giving us an explanatory mechanism. And um, we'd like some more, perhaps, detail of what's going on in each of those circles, squares, and arrows. But at least it's saying, you know, this is, um, how we think it works, and there's an arrow and a process, and you know, it might be the next study says, okay, how do these things influence the appraisal, and how does that appraisal generate different responses? Once you're getting how, then we've got a fairly good looking theory. If I was to summarize the theories, quite unusually in psychology, there are lots of theories. Um, so in some of the textbooks, you'll find uh, two or three dominant theories per topic. Here, as you can clearly see, there are plenty. Um, and that raises interesting questions, to a geek at least, around how you compare and evaluate these theories and go, you know, well actually, what is a good theory? What does a bad theory look like? How could I choose one for my experiment? How could I choose one for my client? And you'll, when you look back, if you try and think of a framework as being a quite simple classification system, a model as something with some arrows but not quite telling us exactly how, so it's a description, and then a theory that gives us clear explanatory mechanisms of how and something that makes testable predictions, you can see a whole range in the, in the history of theories of resilience. So I want to be clear, it's absolutely not okay to just pick one arbitrarily, um, and that's something which we uh, will police in any assignments on this where people, you know, I'm going to study resilience and I've just picked this theory. That's not good enough. 
we need to be able to say as clearly and transparently as possible why a particular theory has been picked to inform your work. And ideally, it should actually be defensible. You know, it should be because it's the right population, it's a good-looking theory, it, it serves the purpose of what I need, it fits the context, etc. Remember as well, as I've said, good theories should explain, not just allow you to categorise retrospectively, but actually explain the how, the mechanism, and a good theory should make predictions that you can test. And if they happen to end up being wrong, then you can modify the theory, and that's progress. So I'm going to progress on to measurement, and I've dumped a bunch of ideas on this slide just to show you there are a lot of attempts to measure resilience, just like there are a lot of theories of resilience. Very often, in psychology especially, uh, a questionnaire is usually paired with its parent theory. And so sometimes we'll see that, you know, that these authors or these questionnaires are clearly derived from a parent theory. Um, and the problem we're having is that some of the work we're currently doing doesn't lend itself to questionnaires because they're usually a one-shot moment in time and we're trying to measure something dynamic and changing. They usually tend to focus on the person and not necessarily the system around them. That's much harder to measure because with a questionnaire, all you can normally measure is the person's perception of that system, which isn't always a true reflection of it. So we're having difficulty, and I've given you a paper on, uh, again, Fletcher and Sarko and how should we measure this, and it, it raises interesting questions. We should at least be trying to capture there has been an adverse event, and there has been a positive adaptation. And those, both of those things, as we've discussed in our last talk, are hard to define, because it depends on the situation, on the person and therefore hard to operationalise into a measurement. One of the most famous questionnaires we currently have is the Colin Davidson Resilience Inventory. We have resilience scales, we have resilience coping scales, heavily based on a coping interpretation. We have um, resilience to trauma, resilience to suicide. And so again, some of them become quite context specific in terms of mental health settings or nursing settings. For better or for worse, that's how it's tended to evolve. The criticisms are in a very quick summary, and you're welcome to look deeper in the, in the paper itself, are that very few explicitly measure both the adversity, which is part of the definition, and the positive adaptation, which is the other part of the definition. We tend to focus on the individual and not the, the process and we tend to therefore take cross-sectional slices rather than looking at this dynamic evolving system. Um, some of the questions we ask in the questionnaires, it's really hard to see why they were asked. Um, in one case, there's an example where they were just taken from kind of a, I think it was a biography of someone who survived an accident on a mountain or tried to climb Everest or something. So that's not how we're supposed to derive our questions for questionnaires. It's actually quite a strict process to follow and, and that's not it, you can't just pick uh, out of the blue. You can ask deeper questions as well around, you know, whether just because I happen to ask a group of questions and some of them cluster together mathematically, does that mean that the thing they've clustered around is resilience or does it reflect something just a bit different? And you have to really question, I'm measuring something here, but is it in fact resilience as defined, you know, technically correctly? We have these context-specific questionnaires, again, notwithstanding that some of them don't uh, use good questions, some of them don't measure both adversity and adaptation. Uh, and I said that, you know, contract validity is what I was referring to. Just because we've got something which, in sort of theoretical space, is clustering together into a, a scale, doesn't necessarily mean that it's measuring resilience. Uh, I've talked about cross-sectional measures being a problem because we're trying to measure something dynamic and evolving. Um, and if we just, at the moment, if we're going to use questionnaires, they probably can't actually detect ongoing changing fluid interactions. We'd need something much more constant, you know, big brothery almost, to try and capture those fluid changing dynamic interactions. 
within questionnaires, we then start you know, worrying about are they reliable and would you expect a measure of resilience to be reliable over time, for example, to give you the same score on different days if it's a complex, changing, evolving system. Um, and with, you know, like I said, you get this idea that when you have question items that appear to relate to the same concepts, you get internal reliability where they correlate with each other, and that's measured by something called Cronbach's alpha, not something you'll have to worry about too often, often worth reporting in, in your write-ups, etc. Um, so just because you've got that internal consistency, you then have to say, right, but is it measuring re resilience or is it measuring some other attribute? Then we get, that leads us to validity in terms of, does it look and feel right? Do those questions reflect the concept that I'm talking about? Does the label given to them reflect what the questions appear to be asking? Um, and there's actually different layers of validity that you can work through. Um, I've talked about that in a separate talk on here if you want to go and look up uh, measurement issues. Um, for the purposes of what we're doing in this unit, there's another problem of, you know, does it actually give me useful information to sit down with a client? Questionnaires are very, very good for working in research because you can give them to a lot of people, you get them all back, you get lots of numbers, you can do correlations, you can divide people into groups and say people who score high on this tend to score high on that. If you've only got one person, that's much harder. So it might be that, as a minimum, you would want to compare their score to the average, but even that might not be that helpful. And sometimes, you know, if you could say to someone, ah, well, you've got good optimism, um, that still leads to the question of, so what? Um, you know, it still hasn't solved my problem. So you, you'd be questioning, you know, do I need to just get a number? Um, you know, that is useful sometimes to say at the end, well, can I come back and see if that number's improved? Um, but even then, in applied practice, very often, once people actually realise how hard the thing is that they're dealing with, they give themselves a lower score. Even though they're demonstrably better at it, they realise that I was naive before and I gave myself 7 out of 10 and I was never 7 out of 10. So now I'm going to give myself a 5 and it looks like your intervention didn't work. So that's a really just worth thinking about. You know, does this, if I'm going to use a questionnaire, is it going to help me with my client? Or is it going to help me in this experiment? But that's, I guess we're talking more about applied purposes in this talk. Once you can measure it, notwithstanding all the problems of using questionnaires, if you try and measure it using questionnaires, you'll find that it tends to correlate with things like life satisfaction, and perceived quality of life, and it's negative correlation with worry. It might correlate negatively with depression and positively with social support, that's good. Um, and you can start to maybe expand the definition of, of correlates if you start dividing people into high and low or good and bad demonstrations of resilience. And you can say, okay, well, the people who tend to demonstrate resilience um, seem to have more co different coping styles, different evaluations of what pain means, because you can interpret pain as being uh, terrible damage occurring, or you can interpret it as information about, well, maybe it's time to stop, maybe something's happening, or something's changing in my body. And of course, you know, at the end of uh, exercise sometimes, it's not that there's terrible damage occurring, it's just a sign that you're actually about to experience the adaptations and you're, you're reaching the maximum capacity and that's good, and therefore no pain, no gain, as they say. So the way people interpret pain can be linked to resilience. Um, it can be linked to catastrophizing tendencies, whether you blow up problems into the end of the world or minimize them and it just uh, doesn't really matter. Um, and then sometimes you see studies where they've broken up resilience and they've measured um, social support, optimism and other things, and then see if they correlate. And of course, that opens up a whole world of saying, well, lots of things correlate to lots of things could be here for a while if we do that. Going Digging into the um, resilience textbook, there's a sort of summary of um, things that are believed to link to resilience. And this is more from a family um, perspective, you know, in terms of developing a healthy, resilient individual. But it's quite an extensive list, and this is kind of becoming a fairly famous list, I, I suppose. So you have, yep, um, child characteristics in terms of their temperament, in terms of how they think and process information, 
uh, how they can form relationships, you can uh, family characteristics, is it harmonious, stable, close relationships, community characteristics, how it's laid out, how people talk, the blend of people in a community. It turns out quite often having a blend of different types of people and different incomes is actually a good thing for a community. So it can be summarised, but this is drawing from a lot long history from a lot of different areas. Uh, and even then, you know, if you were to dig down, you'll find different ways of measuring each of these things and different ways of measuring resilience each time. This is a very broad summary at the macro level. Trying to focus on sport, you can go, OK, here's a quick um, review done by Gali and Gonzalez. And they've said, OK, what was the study? What was the adverse event? What are the indications of positive adaptation? Which those two things are the definition of resilience. And then are there any factors that appear to either contribute to or result from that process? So you go, OK, top study. Um, there was some the general stress of being an elite athlete. And the indication of positive adaptation was winning Olympic gold. OK, good. Kind of fits, I think. And the related factors were achievement motivation, which is usually talking about achievement goal theory. Social support, uh, focus, confidence. So that sounds like it's actually the grounded theory study we're talking about from earlier. Uh, Gally and Bailey talking about um, when they picked the most difficult events, and then uh, you know they've been recommended to the study by some governor or coach or something. And again, achievement motivation, social support. So the same things tend to come out, and that's again not giving us great deep insight into how these things are playing out. But it lets us flesh out that little theory. If we were to scan back now to the Fletcher and Sarkar circular model, we could perhaps be fleshing out some of the things that appear to be related uh, to that system. Because we have theories of achievement motivation, we have theories of social support, so we could perhaps see, well, do those fit, do those help to explain what we're seeing in this resilient response, resilient process? There's a review taken from workplace interventions, so that's occupational psychology mainly. And this is looking at interventions. So the intervention could either be focused on improving resilience on its own, depending on how you measure it, or it could be looking at the, the outcomes. So you could do an intervention designed to improve resilience and just see if it generates something good. So in this review, three out of the six studies they found um, were showing that resilience, as measured by probably a questionnaire, improved. Okay, half and half, that sounds equivocal to me, um, but at least they're out there, at least there are some positives, and of course the next step would be to say, what are the differences? Let's look at those three studies and see if there's anything they did, the other three didn't. Uh, maybe it was the length, maybe it was the strategy, maybe it was the underlying theory, what are the differences, and then perhaps that's informative. Twelve studies managed to find links to health outcomes, and that was actually quite a big effect size. Um, so normally if we're getting, uh, again, without going into too much math, if we're getting effect sizes greater than 0.5 and approaching 1, that's often how they're measured, between 0 and 1, that's, that's a pretty strong effect size. What we didn't see was long-term follow-up, so at the end of your training, great, you appear to be demonstrating less illness or you know, stress or whatever. Uh, mental health, sorry, that's depression, um, but no one was checking further down the track if it was still working, and you want your resilience intervention to be something which sticks, I hope. They found nine studies which looked at psychosocial factors, so um, things like self-esteem. That was the one that tended to show through quite well. Apart from self-esteem, um, it was very mixed findings. So again, would kind of expect people to be saying, you know, if I've built up my resilience, then I should have more self-worth, I should be more confident in dealing with problems, um, I should have better evaluations of my capacity, I should be less anxious, perhaps. So if we're getting mixed effects or small effects, that could be a problem. Several of the studies in this review looked at quite biological mechanisms uh, so fatigue was one, and it showed that fatigue seemed to, to drop, which is good. And there was a coagulant that actually measured um, from blood or saliva, antithrombin, which is a 
prevents your birth from clotting unnecessarily, and that appears to drop off the back of a resilience-based intervention, and that's quite interesting. It might suggest that you're um, experiencing less stress, or again, it might link back to the findings around health, for example. Um, depending how you measure performance, you get different results. So if people were kind of um, rated subjectively, or if they rate themselves, they would say, I think I'm performing better at work. But if you looked at um, fairly objective measures of um, productivity, it was less clear. In fact, sometimes it w there was no effect at all. So uh, if you want to build resilience to improve your workplace productivity, at the moment that link has not been proven. In fact, I'd probably say very few of these links on this slide have been proven and that's because we made resilience differently in these studies. We did different things to achieve those effects. So at the moment, it's kind of a, again, if you look at the landscape of this uh, history of studies, it's quite a mess. There's lots of different approaches, lots of different measurement techniques, different outcomes being measured. And it would be good to have an underlying principle or theory, and dare I say philosophy, that actually underpins all of this so we could arrange things and have a more planned, coherent approach to these studies. So what I tend to do in these studies, as I've said, is different definitions, different techniques and strategies and different measures and that explains a lot of the variation in the studies. You can use statistics in meta-analysis to try and overcome that but ultimately it still um, creates noise uh, most of the studies so far have been based on cognitive behavioural therapy, which is one um, approach, one system for examining and developing um, psychological skills and support. There are other approaches out there. To some extent, CBT, uh, cognitive behavioural therapy, sometimes seems to grow a little bit and encompass other theories and other approaches, and that's you know, just a historical artefact. Um, but ultimately, the, the idea is that if we give the person some sort of more skills, then they'll cope better. And again, that's only a small part, actually, of our definition of resilience and what we think it should be. So we're measuring it inappropriately. It might even be that we're trying to change it inappropriately if we go for a very strict definition of CBT. The structure varied, some were online, some were face to face, some were workshops, some were mentoring. Uh, they usually were 10 to 11 weeks, but we had one that was a 90 minute workshop and one that had 30 hours of planned activities. So that's again a, a big source of variability. Um, with the studies themselves, some of them included deliberately adversity, so you would act out um, stressful situations and role plays. And that, if we look at the definition of resilience, adversity is a key part of it and you have to go through that to be able to adapt and improve. Um, so if we're not having that in your intervention, is it in fact resilience intervention? And just methodology wise, some were randomised to control trials, some were not randomised, some were just no control group, just do some stuff. Pragmatically that can happen, but it again limits what you can conclude afterwards. And so I think of making it quite obvious there are some problems with that broad pattern of research taking place. To summarise then, many different theories, and I think that is quite unusual in psychology. That makes it difficult to reconcile those with definitions, it makes it difficult to know what you're measuring. Um, and the measures tend to contain all sorts of Sometimes problems and oversights and sometimes compromises and I've tried to sketch out how those compromises affect things, you know. The questionnaires have been huge in psychology for a long time and they've done a lot of good in letting us gain traction on difficult problems. But they, by definition, tend to measure something once as a cross-sectional one-off measurement and they tend to measure something which is about the person and, and it needs to be stable. Um, over time, and that isn't what we're playing with, which is resilience. Um, and because you have to develop questionnaires by asking hundreds, maybe thousands of people the same questions, it actually needs there to be something which is consistent across all of those people for it to make it into the final questionnaire. And if there are little unique 
elements, they'll be completely um, abolished in a questionnaire. They'll just be inconsistent, get rid of it. Also, questionnaires, when they're being developed, don't allow items, uh, one question, to feed into two different categories. So it's called cross-loading, it's not allowed. So they get cut out, and again, real life things do interact, and they are related and linked all the time. So it's really difficult then to, to, to work with that, and our definition of resilience is that it's a complex, dynamic system. So we need probably more research, of course, we need better research, of course. We might have to come up with some, some new and intelligent and creative, daring uh, approaches to measure this thing. We, are, we do see broad patterns and we can kind of get some traction and some progress, as you've seen in, in the discussion of evidence. But also within that there are inconsistencies, some understandable because they're from different groups and sometimes not so understandable because we've got bad measures, inconsistent interventions and, and things that seem inexplicable and you look at the whole history of it, you go, well, actually, that, why was that done? How has this ended up like this? What it means is, therefore, that applied practice trying to build resilience needs to be very careful. You need to explain your choice of theory, explain your choice of measurement, and explain any evidence backing it up very carefully and with nuance and, and be critical and say, I, I can't just go in blindly and go, this will definitely work. I need to for example, say this should work, it has the best chance of working compared to the others, and I'm going to build in some checks and measures to make sure that it, if it's not working, I'll find out. That's the only way forwards. We have to be tentative and careful. Um, we'd love to be more certain, um, but actually, underneath it all, it's a very fallible um, body of knowledge right now, uh, and it would be potentially quite scary to run in with confidence saying, I'm sure this will work, because that's how mistakes happen. So because resilience is the very heart of this unit, I'm giving you two readings, um, and I've listed them there, and they will appear on the Moodle site for you. Um, and that's really where we're up to now. So now you should have a really good grasp of what resilience is. We've talked about what came before in terms of mental toughness, and we can start now looking at some of the associated ideas around the psychology of injuries, the psychology of burnout, and so we're looking at, at this stage, of creating resilient athletes. From here, we're going to looking at resilient teams as well. So that's how we're going to progress, and I hope it's all making sense. Um, any questions, you've got to ask me. I'll do everything I can to help. For now, bye.